So, uh, first question. Are the record number of candidates running for mayor a reflection of a greater interest in municipal issues or an indication that there is a high degree of frustration over the performance of this past council? And we will begin, as uh, we predetermined, with Larry Diani. Well, um, a great question. And uh, when I entered, I think I was the second candidate to jump in, even before the current mayor. And certainly Bob waited till the last moment so he could stay on air as long as he could. Um, um, I've heard the candidates, the other candidates speak, and they're concerned about leadership, council decorum, and out-of-control uh, spending. And, in fact, that's why I jumped in, uh, because uh, there was no leadership evidenced uh, over the last four years. Uh, the decorum, uh, thanks to some of the individuals uh, right around this table, was deplorable. And people in the community just felt that we were not moving forwards. We got stuck in silly debates and silly antics, and we need, as a city, to move us in a direction that's positive, that controls our expenditures, that freezes our taxes, that allows good uh, services to be delivered, and makes people proud rather than shaking their heads. Larry Diani. Uh, next, Fred Eisenberger. Well, I know it's uh, it's in the interest of some to uh, create this uh, impression that uh, council is dysfunctional. I would say that uh, 95% of the time uh, this council has worked particularly well. Uh, we've made collective decisions. We've worked together. Uh, we've uh, pursued uh, an aggressive uh, corporate strategic plan. Uh, we pulled that together, and uh, we're now working from a plan. Uh, clearly, there have been moments uh, in time when, uh, when uh, some members of council have uh, – uh, gone off the rails, but I think that's been uh, few and far between. I think, by and large, this council has worked particularly well. Uh, and, and, you know, to the to the point where where our economy is good. We've gone through the worst economic downturn since the uh, the Great Depression. Uh, I think, uh, with a steady hand, we've managed that process. Uh, we've done an awful lot of infrastructure work across the entire city. And uh, I think it's important that, uh, you know, the mayor be the calmest person in the room and uh, manage the uh, the process as well to ensure that people are working together. And when we first uh, came to council, uh, there was a an aura of distrust throughout the entire organization. Uh, staff, senior staff was uh, distrustful of council and vice versa. And we actually took the time to, uh, to have a healing session at Canterbury Hills uh, over two or three days to talk about mutual respect and how people ought to be uh, behaving uh, with one another and against one another. And uh, that has certainly worked particularly well most of the time. And Bob Bertina. Bill, that's a very good point, and I actually brought it up at the debate that took place last night. I think that uh, in the classic days when Jack McDonald and Vic Copps and people like that were battling it out, people understood that there were two or three significant candidates, and we didn't get, you know, 11 and 12 people running. Michael Baldessera was always there, of course, but really I think what the large number of candidates points to the intent of the question, which is that if there is dissatisfaction with who has put their names forward and who has been leader in the past, then more people will come out. And I just want to make one point very clear that the Elections Act allows for broadcasters to stay on the air until uh, the date of the beginning of the campaign or the date that you sign up, whichever comes latest. So I was completely within my rights as a broadcaster to stay on the air, and I knew that I was coming to the end of my broadcast career, and I wasn't going to just walk away from that uh, to please other individuals. So uh, I did the right and proper thing, and I'm happy that I did it. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. In 2007, after considerable lobbying, funds were finally committed by both the federal and provincial governments to remediate Randall Reef, one of the worst toxic hotspots in the country. To date, no discernible progress seems to have been made on this project, in spite of the fact that the funding is on the table. What is your position on this issue? And we'll begin with Fred Eisenberger. Well, it was my uh, my pleasure to actually pull the, uh, the funding together from uh, both levels of government. They made commitments of uh, $30 million each. Uh, we've, uh, the city of Hamilton has made significant commitments. In fact, we topped it up just recently uh, to, uh, to get it further along, and we're waiting for, uh, for Halton to make a commitment to our harbor as well. And the, uh, the outstanding issue is uh, who's going to project manage this uh, process. And uh, I think it's pretty clear now that uh, we're narrowing it down to uh, public works. 
uh, to uh, to be Public Works Canada, to be the overseer of the project. Uh, it was first perceived to be the uh, Port Authority. Uh, they, they say they don't want to do it. Uh, because there aren't any funds identified for them to manage that process. And so I think it's now narrowing down to Public Works Canada, and we're closer to uh, than ever, in fact, of uh, getting the shovels in the water and getting this project going. Uh, it's taken more time. It's been difficult. There are many agencies involved, including uh, Environment Ontario and uh, 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 Public Works Canada. Uh, there have been ongoing discussions to sort some of those uh, oversight issues out and uh, the, some liability issues out in terms of uh, when those properties are remediated, and I think that they will be soon. It will, it'll begin soon. Uh, that uh, the uh, the long-term liability is something that the Port Authority had some concern over. So those discussions have been ongoing. Uh, the, uh, the city staff have been working really hard to pull it all together. Uh, U.S. Steel has made a commitment as part of their uh, their their involvement in the uh, in the process. So I think all the commitments are there except for Halton. And uh, once we get the public works issue sorted out, we're uh, ready to go. Next, Bob Bertina. Well, here is a, a true issue of of leadership or perhaps lack of it, because we've been waiting for who's going to project manage the issue. And in terms of the funding, the city share uh, is about $5 million. We have a commitment from U.S. Steel. Now, you ask Local 1005 about U.S. Steel commitments. We are really not very far down this road, despite the fact that we do have the commitments of $30 million each from the province and the federal government. So why we should uh, continue to stumble along in, in some sort of a vacuum, uh, I find hard to believe, because we have to get to this. This is one of the greatest black marks against the city of Hamilton, one of the most toxic spots in any body of water in the country. And we've been dragging our heels in terms of moving this project ahead. So uh, it's a leadership issue. Someone's got to make some decisions in a hurry, and we've got to get on with this business. Larry Deany, same Bill, question. Bill, I started uh, this process of lobbying the other levels of government uh, fully seven years ago. I visited uh, Ottawa. Herb Gray, who was uh, the Canadian chair of the International Joint Committee, was on side. We visited with ministers. We actually had commitments from the province as well as the previous government, uh, the $30 million from the previous Liberal government, which was recommitted when the Conservatives came in. And after seven years, listen to Fred's language. We are narrowing it down. We are closer than ever. It's taken more time. Once we get it sorted out, we are ready to go. This is shameful language. This is language of delay and deferral. This is not the language of action. This is a toxic hotspot, the worst in the Great Lakes that needs to be cleaned up. And we have the will to do it uh, as a community, but it seems that our local government, led by two individuals on council who have not pushed it. I've not read about this in the paper. I've not seen these guys stand up and say this has got to get done. They've delayed and dithered, and we are still where we were seven years ago. If I'm there, this is a priority for us. Right here, right now, we want to hear your position on the issue of area rating, and we'll start with Bob Rutina. Bill, the mayor was quite right in putting uh, the matter to a a group of uh, independent uh, people, because basically the, the suburbs who are affected by the area rating don't trust the old city, and we have this issue, and I'm sure it'll come up about the amalgamation or not. So I believe the direction was was well placed to have an independent review of what we have brought forward, because the people affected uh, were feeling that we weren't treating them fairly. But I think the ultimate answer to area rating is a complete review of the municipal structure to see if what started on on January the 1st, 2011, uh, 2201, 10 years later, January 1st, 2011, is still effective and is achieving the objectives that were set out. I don't think it is. I think we need that municipal restructure. And by having the restructure review, we'll we'll find a better outcome uh, than what we simply have on the table that we now call area rating. And that could be de-amalgamation in some cases. Next, Larry Deany. So I didn't hear an answer. Is he for retaining area rating or not? Well, you may want to answer later on. He's dodging like he always does. Look, area rating is about increasing taxes to the suburbs by 10 to 20%. And making a decision by plan that these two guys supported the month after this election – This is the classic 
political dodge. I've been on record as saying that we retain area rating and we do a services review to see whether the services that we deliver are being delivered efficiently, whether they're needed, and whether we can do them differently. And I want to find t- savings. We freeze taxes. We don't increase them by 10 to 20 percent. We freeze them, and we certainly do it in a transparent way. We don't wait until the month after the election, uh, as per plan, that Fred and Bob have approved to make a decision as important as this. And Fred Eisenberger. Well, clearly, uh, either uh, Mr. Deany is uh, misinforming or he's misinformed. Uh, you know, to suggest that there's going to be 10 to 20 percent uh, tax increases across the entire community is outrageous. Uh, he's uh, he's uh, he's been making claims like that throughout our community and doing some American-style politicking, uh, fear-mongering. I think that's unfortunate. Uh, clearly, we set a, a process aside that uh, that uh, looks at area rating with uh, independent citizens. You know, in our, our mission statement, we say we want to engage citizens, and that's exactly what we've done. <laughs> We've brought citizens in, uh, independent citizens out there with, through a, a selection process, not unlike a jury process, called a consensus forum, have them all brought in from all areas of the city to have a look at area rating, which is largely misunderstood. People don't know what is area rated. People don't know what isn't area rated. I think it's important that uh, through this process people get an understanding of what area rating is. I am for area rating. Uh, I believe it needs to stay, but it also needs to be adjusted from time to time because the uh, the variables are, are, are shifting. And uh, the original intent for area rating was to protect, protect the rural taxpayer from services they don't get, and uh, that should be our hallmark. Uh, but as you re-urbanize or urbanize the city, there are also adjustments that need to be made for services that uh, new new parts of the city do get. So that's why we set out this process. I think Bob Bertin and I both supported that for all the right reasons, <coughs> to provide an opportunity for greater edu- education and understanding in the broader community, to engage our citizens in the decision-making process and provide advice, and to, uh, to put it to the next council, quite frankly, who are the ones that are going to have to implement this in any event. So it may be uh, maybe Bob, it may be Larry, it may be me. But clearly, uh, people need to understand this and appreciate area rating for what it is. We uh, are going to break in just a couple of minutes. I'm going to introduce the next question, and I guess we'll get to as many of the answers as we can before we have to do a short break. Uh, This is the Bill Kelly Show, 900 CHML, Cable 14, our mayor's debates uh, with uh, Larry Diani, Fred Eisenberger, and Bob Bertina. And uh, your participation in Hour 2 of the program, uh, when we will go to phone calls for your questions and, of course, emails from uh, our listeners and our viewers as well. Uh, next question. Council imposed a salary freeze on non-unionized employees in 2009. A number of unionized contracts will expire next year. Public Works and HSR drivers, for example. In those negotiations, what will be your position on wage rates? And we'll begin again with Larry Diani. Well, I think that uh, Council was very unfair in singling out individuals within the corporation uh, who are non-unionized for a different treatment. They had no protection um, in uh, any collective agreement process, and they were picked upon by Council for the sake of expediency. Uh, my intention uh, is to, um, in the next term of Council, is to be fair to all employees. I want to do a services review. I want to try to save some money by offering services in a different way or offering services in a more efficient way or not offering services that are not needed. And I want to take that money that we save uh, to uh, stabilize taxes, freeze taxes, and hopefully stabilize them for the long term and invest them in uh, all the programs, and that means staff as well, all the programs that are needed by the community. I think that's responsible. It's not selectively p- picking people out for punishment, especially those who don't have the protection of a union uh, that uh, that uh, m- might be afforded to others. Fred Eisenberger. Well, I, I, I support the collective bargaining process. Uh, you know, that's uh, that's a uh, you know a well-established process that uh, that uh, brings in the unions and the city staff and uh, does some serious negotiations about how we continue to move forward. Uh, I think we need to be fair to all parties, but I think uh, I think all, par- all all of us understand that once you have a collective bargaining agreement, you're. Uh, you're, uh, you have to adhere to that. Uh, we did have discussions with the unions in terms of uh, their, some, of, some opportunity for them to uh, participate in uh, reducing some of our costs, and uh, uh, they were not on for having those discussions. And I think uh, our next strategy ought to be talking about uh, how do we uh, uh, create fairness in the entire process for all of our employees 
to ensure that we uh, we get some savings or at least some some manageable uh, you know uh, wage rates that uh, that will help us save some monies and and use those some of those monies to to do uh, infrastructure work. But you know, collective bargaining, as the province found out uh, not too long ago. Uh, It's a very difficult thing to have to deal with. You're uh, locked into uh, agreements that uh, you are responsible to fulfill, uh, and uh, you couldn't get at them until the the next round of bargaining. And I think the next round of bargaining will, will be interesting.